tempo, hein? Wyatt, come on out here, buddy. This is my good friend Wyatt, and he rang the bell today, and he was baptized just the other day. Thank you, Wyatt, so much. You're welcome. Okay. Let us sing the first hymn. It's, I think, number 41, To God Be the Glory. be seated. Again, welcome to Chapel by the Sea. If it's your first time, uh, we certainly welcome you, and, and uh, we are an interdenominational church, which simply means we accept all who come uh, in faith and love, and uh, so we're certainly welcome, and uh, we believe that uh, God lives here, and this, not only the beautiful surroundings that we have, uh, but this church is a mission church, and we believe that uh, the people who worship here love God and love people, so uh, we seek to carry out God's mission. And so thank you again for, for worshiping. I just want to mention to you that these beautiful flowers are, are given uh, by uh, Candy Sanger and her family, and it's in memory of her mother, Catherine DuPont Weymouth, and her twin sister, Margaret Lures Ogden. And so thank you so much for those uh, beautiful flowers So, and that. Um, so let's uh, take this uh, time to just uh, be silent and, and uh, be in touch with God as, as we bow our heads. Now God, settle our hearts as we seek to be in touch with your loving spirit.
Help us to be affirmed that you are not only with us, but that you have a plan for our lives. You have a plan for humanity. We give glory to you and to your son, Jesus Christ, as we worship this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue to pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you turn in your um, hymnals then uh, to number 618 in the Psalter, number 618. It is Psalm 37, and we'll do verses 1 through 6, and I will read the first verse, and you will read the next verse through verse 6. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live life in the land and enjoy security. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. First of our scriptures is from the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 45, and uh, you may be familiar with uh, Joseph and uh, all the things that uh, transpired in his life, uh, but we pick up the story of Joseph in uh, chapter 45 of Genesis, and uh, Joseph has uh, entertained his brothers. His brothers did not know who he was because he had been separated from the family for a number of years. And, but Joseph uh, wants to have a family reunion. So hear this, all the emotions that take place here as he makes himself known to his brothers. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly uh, that the uh, servants heard him and the Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler over all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. 
you, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine is, are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all you belong to who you believe will become destitute. Such a powerful story of family and family separation and reunion. Uh, it, is, it is certainly a powerful word for us to consider. As we go through our, our time of prayer, um, I want to mention some prayer concerns. Um, I mentioned last week about uh, Tom and Linda Nyman. Tom served here for uh, three years here at the Chapel by the Sea, and uh, Tom's been in the hospital, is, is still in the hospital, uh, is weak, and, and will plan once he leaves the hospital uh, to go into rehab. Uh, his wife Linda was to have surgery our knee on Tuesday, but that was postponed. And so she continues to walk in pain, uh, but wants to continue to, to uh, visit her husband. And uh, so we need to think of uh, Tom uh, Nyman and his, his wife, Linda. And then also uh, want you to know that uh, Tom uh, Lomas, who was uh, coming here at, at the chapel very regularly a few years ago, has passed away. And uh, um, just uh, Candy, I don't know if you don't mind, but uh, you, she has details. Uh, of Tom uh, and his obituary, if you'd like to know that. Uh, we pray for his wife, Sharon, as well. And then uh, I want to, I was just made aware that uh, this is the one year anniversary uh, of the death of, of Dave Jensen. And uh, so we need to remember uh, Queenie, um, and uh, we also need to remember the Jensen family. This has got to be a difficult day. It was a very unexpected death. So, so anyhow, uh, a number of things going on, and I'm sure that there are many things stirring in your hearts. It could be joy. It could be sadness. But God knows our hearts, so let us take our concerns and joys to the Lord at this time. A loving God, you know the concerns that are in our hearts right now. These concerns raise our blood pressure, give us anxiety, sometimes to the point of despair, even depression. And yet we know, Lord, that you have been with us in all circumstances. Your word declares it, and we know it in our hearts, that you will continue to work in our lives in spite of our feelings, whether we're feeling anxious or sad, yet still, you help us to find joy. So Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus the Christ. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that helps us to get up each morning and in spite of whatever we feel to say thank you for this day. That's the point, Lord, each day. Help us each day as we worship today that tomorrow we will continue to worship you, continue to give you all the honor, glory, and praise. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Second of our scriptures this morning is in the New Testament. At, uh, last week we talked a little bit about uh, the Sermon on the Plain from Luke, and we will continue that. Um, and uh, I'm going to pick up the story in uh, chapter 6 uh, as Jesus teaches uh, keys to the kingdom, kingdom principles. It's entitled Love Your Enemies. But to you who are listening, I say, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, 
And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Again, may God add his blessings to the living out and understanding of God's word. Let us pray. Now, Lord, may your word sink into our hearts. Not only that we would take it seriously, but that we would live it out. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's, I didn't know that Wyatt was going to be here today. But just a couple days ago, Wyatt here was baptized. And uh, as I was preparing today's service, I thought of Wyatt. And... Uh, one of the things that was neat about him was that when we met out here, uh, I could tell he was quite a guy. I mean, he gave me a high five and he gave me a fist bump and he was very excited about being baptized. And I think his mom and dad had prepared him well. Now, Wyatt, you're five years old, right, Wyatt? He's five years old. So after we meet, uh, we go into the church, and as I do with all baptisms, the first thing I talk about is to say that the baptism is for Wyatt. It's not for the parents. Now, the parents answer questions. The most important one is that they believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and pledge your allegiance to his kingdom. That's one of the questions I asked parents. And, of course, parents and his grandparents were there, and I knew that they were going to affirm Wyatt and bring him up with love and care and in the faith. And so it comes time for the baptism, and I usually what I do is uh, I pour water into the baptismal font, and, you know, our baptismal font is like a big seashell. You know that, right? But it's beautiful. And so I, and I talk a little bit about the power of water that God uses. And, and, and then I had Wyatt come up, and I was a little bit interesting. Uh, I thought his parents were going to come up too, but Wyatt just marched on up by himself. And so he stood there, and, and uh, I pointed to the baptismal font, and I said to Wyatt, I said, uh, Wyatt, I'm going to baptize you with some of this water. Do you know what his answer was? How much water are you going to put on me? <laughs> that was an excellent thing. But you know what? I thought later, I said, God's got a good plan for Wyatt. And isn't that the case? If you've been parents or grandparents and, and you've been through baptisms or whatever the case might be, what do you want? You want the best for your kids. You want the best for your grandkids. You want them to grow up in the faith because it's so important. He, we want him to know not only who Jesus was, but who he is. And it will shape his life in a very special way. We all want that. Well, God's plan is very important. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what is God's plan for us. Have you ever thought about that? You know, we think about, we make plans. I'm sure when Wyatt gets bigger, he's going to have plans. His parents have plans for him. But we, we live out our plans that we make ourselves, but we never think about too much about God's plan. Um, I've, I've mentioned to you before that my wife Rosemary and I, uh, we were 
uh, what was called presenting couples in worldwide marriage encounter for 10 years. And there's uh, like 13 different faith expressions that do worldwide marriage encounter. And, and uh, it's a whole weekend. It's a Friday evening through Sunday evening. And, and uh, so it's a very special thing. And our goal is, of course, to make good marriages better. That's, it's a communication tool. But it's also very spiritual. And uh, I remember once we were uh, going to be doing a weekend down in Columbus, Ohio. And we have a, on Friday evenings early, we had this leadership dinner and we discussed the weekend and all of the people who were involved. And uh, we had a waitress that was just exuberant. She was very excited and very talkative and very nice. And, and uh, so we're talking together and, and she asked me, she says, what denomination are you? And I said, oh, we're United Methodist. Oh, she says, well, you know, the Frozen Chosen were here last week. Is there any Presbyterians in the crowd? <laughs> we love you. And I didn't even know Stephen was going to be here today. I forgot. But, you know, Frozen Chosen, you know, she was just having fun. She loved the Presbyterians. The Presbyterians love God. And the Presbyterians, you know, you can make fun as far as, you know, preordained or predestined. You know, it's like the woman, the Presbyterian lady who fell down the stairs and after she picked herself up, she said, thank God that's over. <laughs> but don't leave Presbyterians because here's the good thing. Presbyterians believe that God has a plan. God has a plan. Now, I think that's really important for us to delve into today. And uh, one, of the, one of the books that I read a number of years ago uh, was by Leslie Weatherhead. It was called The Will of God. And it's a little paperback. You can get it. Uh, but I always enjoyed it because it, it kind of, uh, even though God's plan isn't simple uh, and, it, and it's mysterious, yet still he put it in a context that helped me to seek to understand what God's will is. Leatherhead said that uh, there's three aspects of God's will. There's God's intentional will. And if you go back to the creation story in Genesis, I mean, the Garden of Eden was beautiful, wasn't it? And Adam and Eve walked in the garden. They were one with God, and God was with them, and, and they seemed at peace. And that was God's intention, God's intentional will for us to walk with God in a very peaceful way. Well, then Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. And so Leatherhead says that there is God's circumstantial will, where even though we have free will and sometimes we abuse that and we are all sinners and, and we uh, fall short of the glory of God, yet still God's will be done. God's plan continues to be fulfilled in the midst of that. And of course, in the Christian tradition, we, we believe that Jesus' death and resurrection uh, was, that, was that power where, where we, God's plan was overcame death and sin and and we can live freely again with God through that salvation through that redemption but then as Leatherhead says the end is God's ultimate will that in spite of our circumstances God will continue to work and God's salvation will come for all so that was Leatherhead but what I, I mentioned this because God's will defined is God's plan for humanity. And so they're one and the same, essentially. And so today, I want us to look at Genesis 45. Because in Genesis 45, we have Joseph. And do you remember Joseph? That he had a lot of circumstances in his life, didn't he? I mean, Joseph, he had this coat of many colors, right? And Joseph, he was kind of a brat, wasn't he? I mean, he really was. He kind of flaunted it in front of his brothers, and his brothers got mad at him finally. They'd had enough of him. And so this wasn't right, but his brothers threw him into a pit, were going to kill him, talked it over, finally sold him into slavery. That was a tough circumstance, wasn't it? And then Joseph goes, and he is a slave uh, in Pontifer's household, and he's doing well. And then Pontifer's wife uh, falsely accuses him of adultery. Well, he's thrown in jail. 
that's another tough circumstance. And then Joseph, in, in the jail, he knows how to interpret dreams, and he seems to have leadership qualities. So the head jailer puts him in charge uh, of, of coordinating the jail. And, and so, you know, finally, the, the Pharaoh's cupbearer and his baker are, fall out of favor with Pharaoh. He's, those guys are in jail. And Joseph interprets their dreams. And when the cupbearer, he's the one who saw, survived. The other one didn't do it. But he survived, and Joseph had said, if you find favor with Pharaoh, remind him of what I did. Well, the cupbearer forgot. And so for another couple of years, there's Joseph in jail until finally he's able to interpret a dream for the king, the Pharaoh. And he becomes the second most powerful person in Egypt. And th then we come to his brothers coming back. And um, Joseph knows his brothers before they know who he is. And you heard the story of his tears, that he just couldn't hold it back any longer. And he brings his, his family closer to him. And he says, don't be frightened. And what were they frightened of? They were frightened that Joseph had become the second most powerful person in Egypt. He could use his power to put his brothers in jail. He could put them to death, whatever the case might be. And yet, what Joseph had come to realize is that God had a plan for his life, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. So let us stop and think for a minute. What is God, God's plan for my life? I mean, Many of us have had difficult circumstances, and all of us have had to deal with COVID. And our friends, were, we were just talking about teachers and, and uh, healthcare workers and people quitting their jobs and, and people at each other's throats. And it's been really difficult two and a half years dealing with this. It's affected people all over the world. In those circumstances, God has a plan for our lives. And I want us to think about the fact of what God did in the heart of Joseph that he was able to overcome the temptation to use his power to get back at his brothers. Instead of payback, he gave them grace. Isn't that powerful? How do you overcome resentment and hate? God has a plan. And what Joseph said to his brothers is that God sent me over here. And I went through all of these things. Golly, that sounds Presbyterian to me. <laughs> but God had this plan for Joseph. And Joseph says to his brothers, God sent me here to save you. So bring my father over because I want to save you as my family and live in peace. That's powerful, dear friends, and that's the goal. It's like in, in, in chapter 6 of Luke where Luke talks, or excuse me, Jesus talks about life in the kingdom of God. He, he, he talks about forgiving people that we really, as a human being, how would we forgive them? And yet he says people, if you lend to them, don't expect anything back, but forgive. So forgiveness, dear friends, is radical. So how do I learn how to forgive well the first thing is to remember that God's plan for all humanity is salvation we are saved by grace through faith it's not our own doing it is a gift of God lest anyone sh should boast so that and this is Ephesians 2 10 we become God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works through him you see, when we experience God's grace and the love of God overflows and conquers the, that hate, then we do some powerful work in the name of God. And that's what Joseph did. And that's what you and I can do. So that's the, that's the overall. That's a, to me, the cross and the resurrection for Christians is a clear plan of salvation. That's it. And yet what we don't do sometimes is we don't think about how God uses you and me. 
and that God touches our hearts, that if God's forgiveness is so strong in our life and that we, we can say, yes, God, thank you every day, then God's going to put us in a situation that we can help other people. You remember God's spell? I know I'm dating myself here, but uh, God's spell, uh, you know, day by day, three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, and to follow thee more nearly. I think that's a starting point for us every day. Every day, say those three things. And I pray that God's plan will continue to be lived out in you, all of us, that we might make a difference in this world. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, thank you for your plan. Help us then, Lord, that even in the midst of difficult circumstances, we would continue to turn to you and recognize that you will make a difference through all of the difficult circumstances that we might experience, that we might experience that ultimate will, which is for your, you to save. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to be a part of that ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand and sing, and uh, I don't know if this will be familiar to you, um, so we'll see what happens, but help us accept each other. We'll do verses 1, uh, 2, and 4. 1, 3, and 4, excuse me. 1, 3, and 4. Oh, 289, excuse me. seated. As I say often, there are no members here at Chapel by the Sea. There are just people, I call them unpaid servants, uh, but they are loving people who love God and love others. And you can look at our uh, board over here, uh, the agencies that we support each year uh, are listed here. And it's not just that we send them money. Uh, we have a missions committee that goes and gets involved and uh, many are, are involved in all kinds of min mission organizations around the islands because there are many people who are struggling on the islands. And uh, so 
your the collection we take, uh, almost, not all, but almost 50% goes to that kind of mission. So we thank you for your offering. May the ushers come forward. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you that you have a plan for each one of us to live it out. Lord, we give you give to this ministry that you have provided, that others might be touched and their lives be changed, that they would know God's plan for them. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Just have a a couple of announcements uh, that I'd like to share with you. Uh, this next Tuesday uh, is uh, the Interfaith Outreach of Sand Camp, uh, which is a collaboration of the island faith communities, including Chapel by the Sea, St. Michael of All Angels, Congregational UCC, and Temple Bat Yam, have partnered with Fish of Sand Camp and the Dubin Center to offer a monthly gathering at the Sanibel Community House for those living with memory loss or dementia and their caregivers. The first meeting will be February 22nd from 10 o'clock to 1130 and they will continue to meet the fourth Sunday of each month. So we'll continue to pray for this ministry. It's just getting going and I pray that uh, God will bless it in, so, in many ways. Um, then I want to mention we had a six week study on the book of Ephesians uh, that has concluded. And so on Tuesday, March the 1st, we will start our Lenten study. Uh, it will be a, a Bible study, but it will be based on the book by Henry Nouwen. Uh, it's called Downward Mobility, uh, The Selfless Life of Christ. And, and so uh, let me know if you'd like to be a part of We meet here on Tuesday. It will start Tuesday, March the, yeah, March the 1st. And we'll be mainly sitting outside if the weather holds up. And... Uh, and so I hope that you'll uh, take part in that. If you, just see me if you'd like to be a part. And, and, uh, and then um, March the 2nd, uh, just to get into uh, the Lenten season, uh, is Ash Wednesday. We will have an Ash Wednesday service here uh, at the church at noon on Ash Wednesday. 
And then I uh, mentioned uh, March 30th is World Day of Prayer. Uh, we will also have what I call Tizay, or a meditative service at noon that day. But as it always is, the church is open every day for prayer. And many people use it, come out on. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, all the ministry that is provided here at the chapel will help us all grow closer to God. So let us continue and, and conclude our service with uh, hymn number 495. They'll know we are Christians by our love. We'll sing uh, verses 1, 3, and 4, number 495. <laughs> So let us go forth day by day and let us seek to know the Lord more clearly and to love more dearly and to follow more nearly. Go in peace and love, dear friends. Amen.